This week, we will be learning about the art of cinematography and learning what a cinematographer does. Typically on Hollywood movies, the person holding the camera is not the director, but rather the cinematographer. The cinematographer, or the director of photography, most often referred to as the DP, chooses lenses and picks camera positions that best articulate the story. The cinematographer is also responsible for coming up with a lighting scheme and composing shots that are lit well. The chief lighting technician on the set is called a gaffer. This person works out a light scheme with the cinematographer that works well with the movie. Just as the production designer might be concerned with sets, props, and costumes, cinematographers are concerned primarily with things that have to do with the camera. Lighting and exposure, camera proxemics, and the focal length of the lens. Without good lighting, scenes look very flat and drab. If you want a movie to come to life, you want a good three-point lighting setup that will help tell the story and make the images pop. Camera movement is about changing the angles within a shot or setting up uh, a camera in an interesting position uh, to capture the most visual information. Still, another component of camera is focal length. Sometimes in a frame, you might throw things out of focus for dramatic effect, or you might choose to keep everything in the shot in focus. These three components help shape the visual landscape of the story. The cinematographer captures the mood of the picture through the use of visuals. Basic cinematography rules stipulate that there should be three lights on a subject at any given time. According to your textbook, these three lights are called the key light, fill light, and the backlight. In the accompanying documentary, which I'll be sending to you, Richard Barsam talks about how key light, fill light, and backlight work together to produce a viable image. Lighting can definitely shape a scene's mood or suggest character motivation. The two images that you see in the slide have contrasting moods. The left one is a pleasant and brightly lit scene. The one on the right is a dark and moody scene. A lot of how we feel in a movie is informed by the lighting scheme. In your textbook, high key and low key are described as two opposing lighting schemes that you can use in a given film. One aspect of lighting that might be confusing is the fact that high key shots tend to be very low contrast. In the image that you see here, we have bright even light throughout and there is very little contrast between the background and the woman's outfit. Low key shots tend to be very high contrast. In this image, you can see that there is a huge difference between the subject's uh, right side and the subject's left side. One side is very, very dark and the other side is very bright. So if the ratio is very extreme, we say that this is high contrast photography, which tends to feature a bright key light. Here we have an example of the same subject lit low key and high key. Notice that the character's expression is the same in both images. The one on the left demonstrates a scene that might be a little bit more dramatic than the one on the right. The one on the right tends to evoke something with more levity, more comedy. Here's another set of images with the same subject that demonstrate high key lighting and low key lighting. Notice that the image on the right has a more dramatic appeal to it. It might not be exactly the lighting scheme that you would choose for your own portraits or uh, your own headshot. The image on the left shows a little bit more brightness. It might actually be the kind of lighting scheme that you would find on an ID photo or your driver license photo. Its intention is to show all of the detail in the shot. According to your textbook, camera proxemics is the study of the nearness and the closeness of the camera to the subject. As a cinematographer, you always have to be conscious of the distance of the camera to the subject because distance creates a sense of space and intimacy between the character and the audience. Sometimes cinematographers use proxemics and camera movement to articulate an idea visually. If there is something important in the image, the camera moves closer towards it. The word proximity gives us the word proxemics. The way that I'm going to teach this concept in this course is that proxemics refers to the change in the distance of camera to the subject from shot to shot or from the beginning of the film to the end of the film. 
As you watch today's film, and as you watch the subsequent films for this class, you should ask yourself, how does proxemics play into how I'm understanding this picture? Is the director or cinematographer helping me understand something by moving the camera closer? Or is the director or cinematographer moving the camera further away from the subject to show the grandness of the background? In cinematography, there is a special relationship between camera proxemics and emotional response. Viewers tend to feel a greater emotional response to a certain character if the camera is closer to that subject. This very crudely created graph shows that as you get closer to the subject, the intimacy between the character on screen and the audience member is increased. If the camera moves back to a wide shot, perhaps there is a little bit of dramatic distance between the subject and the viewer. Here's a list of different camera moves. You may have heard of some of these terms before used colloquially by your friends. For example, panning or dollying or pushing or zooming with the camera creates different dramatic effects that might be necessary when telling your picture. You do not need to memorize this list of camera moves. Just understand that there are different types of camera moves that a cinematographer will employ in any given picture. Even a movie's lack of camera movement tells its own type of story. Whenever you are filming a movie, you want to provide the editor with a variety of different shot types and a variety of camera movements so that the editor has enough shots to choose from when assembling the film. We will talk about this process in more detail when we discuss editing. The work of storyboard artists is very key in assisting some cinematographers and some directors. Being able to visualize how a shot will look before you start filming saves a lot of time and money. In this chapter, one of the main things you should learn to do is to differentiate between shots that are moving and shots that are not moving. Shots that don't have any movement in them are called static frame. Shots that show some motion are called dynamic frame. Static frame tends to evoke feelings of calmness or stillness. Dynamic frame tends to create a sense of chaos and movement. Think about films that are shot with a handheld camera. Another component of cinematography is the manipulation of the camera's focus. The focal plane of a camera lens can be adjusted by the cinematographer to mimic the visual components of the human eye. Notice that in these three images, the subject matter is exactly the same, but the way the background is visualized is different in all three. The image on the right shows the most amount of separation between subject and background. You might think that a photograph that's out of focus is unappealing, but sometimes in a movie, sometimes in photography even, especially contemporary photography, we change the camera's depth of field to draw our attention to certain things that are in focus, and we might throw things that are not important out of focus. In these two images, there are elements to the frame that are out of focus, but it is okay because the thing that we want to look at is sharply in focus. Let's compare a deep focus shot and a shallow focus shot. In deep focus shots, everything is in focus. In shallow focus shots, only certain elements are in focus. In these two images of the same woman, you can see that the deep focus shot, which is on top, features a foreground and background that are both crisp. In the image on the bottom, which is shallow focus, there is a separation between background and foreground. Filmmakers of the past, like Orson Welles or Alfred Hitchcock, were famous for featuring a lot of deep focus photography in their movies. Deep focus is sometimes very difficult to achieve. In this image from Citizen Kane, you can see that the foreground, midground, and background are all sharply in focus, creating a very interesting visual experience for the viewer. The viewer chooses which part of the frame he or she wants to focus on at any given time. 
in a lot of contemporary films, sometimes the director or cinematographer uh, draws your attention exactly to what they want you to look at. Sometimes by throwing things out of focus and keeping only certain elements of the shot in focus, the cameraman, the cinematographer, the director is doing the hard work for you. In the movie Master and Commander Far Side of the World, this shot features a rack focus from something that is very, very close to the camera to something that is very, very far away. The cinematographer here uses shallow focus very effectively to show the shift of attention from a character who is looking at something very close to his face and something that is very far away. This concludes the presentation. As a review, today we talked about lighting, camera movement, and lens. These are three different components that cinematographers are concerned with when telling a story. When you're watching a film that is known for its good cinematography, look for how the cinematographer or the cameraman is responsible for exposing an image that has good lighting, or moving the camera in a way that features interesting camera movement, or racking the focus of the lens back and forth to draw certain elements in the foreground and the background to the viewer's attention.